Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Taylor Combalusier, a mining analyst at Ragged Cloud Securities, Inc. Today's webinar focuses on Fidelity Minerals Corp, which is assembling and advancing a portfolio of mining assets in Peru through the implementation of its strategic project generator model. The project generator model involves the identification and acquisition of appraisal stage opportunities with near-term valuation catalysts, including the potential for high impact M&A. The company is currently advancing four key projects across several prolific belts in Northern Peru, including Las Brujas, Greater Las Vaquias, Porphyritic Copper, and Cerro El Bronce. Today I have with me on the webinar, Ian Graham, CEO, and Baje Azkamak, Executive Chairman of Fidelity Minerals. The format for the webinar will be, Baje will provide an, an overview of Fidelity Minerals and then delve into its mission and strategic model, and then Ian will provide a detailed at the company's projects in Peru. Following that, uh, we'll take live questions. So please send us your questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so to get started, we'll hand handle the disclosures and then get into it. Um, for Fidelity Minerals, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of their presentation located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. For Fidelity Minerals, I would note that in the last 12 months preceding the date of this webinar, Red Cloud Securities, Inc. has performed investment banking services or has been retained under a service or advisory agreement by the issuer. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Bahe to update you on Fidelity and what investors have to look forward to with this company. Thanks for Thanks those, for those uh, opening uh, remarks, Taylor, and thank you to uh, Red Cloud Securities for the opportunity to present the Fidelity Minerals uh, um, opportunity, and thank you to everybody who's decided to join uh, the Fidelity Minerals um, webinar uh, today. Um, Fidelity Minerals, Fidelity Minerals is really about chasing big copper and gold in Peru. So with um, copper prices bouncing back strongly, and whilst gold has come off, we think with everything that's happening in the world, these are the right commodities to be in. We think Peru is the right place to be chasing these commodities. So today we'll be providing a short presentation. I'll be providing <laughs> a five-minute corporate um, overview of Fidelity Minerals before handing over to Ian Graham, our CEO, who will provide more of an overview on the projects and some technical um, information. So we have our um, standard disclaimers. So we'll be referencing a historical mineral resource, some exploration um, results, as well as some forward-looking statements. So we encourage everybody to observe the um, disclaimers associated with the presentations. Um, and any questions, please feel free to reach out. So just an initial snapshot of what Fidelity is all about. So what we've essentially done is we've assembled a large project portfolio in northern Peru. It consists of a large epithermal uh, historic resource, so a known resource with almost half a million ounces of gold. 5 million ounces of silver and um, a couple of discovered porphyries. We've assembled a portfolio of four additional or three additional projects, which we believe uh, have the potential to host significant gold resources. And part of our strategy involves advancing these projects and potentially acquiring additional projects to basically get to a million ounce target. We think for a company our size with our existing projects, there's a reasonable prospect of achieving that target in this part of the world. And that's our primary strategy for creating shareholder value within Fidelity Minerals. So that's a, a brief summary about Fidelity Minerals. In terms of the corporate uh, structure, we have a modest market capitalization of $5 million. 
Um, almost two thirds of the register is controlled by the board, major shareholders and associates of the company. So a very tight capital structure and um, all the insiders uh, feature heavily as major shareholders of the company. So we're aligned with every other um, a shareholder of the company. Importantly, I'll outline a transition the company has recently undergone, but we have net proceeds of US $800,000 due to the company in the next six or seven months in a series of staged payments. So for a moderate, um, modest market capitalization, tight capital structure and reasonable uh, funding options, including in the money options, we think the company represents a compelling opportunity at this valuation. In terms of the team, um, we'll provide some details shortly. Key point I would make is we've operated in Peru a long time. Our general manager who managed our Cerro Dorado mill has recently transitioned to a country manager role. And I think that's very important in how we've gone about securing some projects and how we think we can move these projects forward. So uh, a lot of detail here, but I think the key point to highlight here is a transition the company has undergone in the last two years. So uh, two years ago, when I joined the company, uh, we had a legacy toll mill, essentially of what we now consider sub-economic scale. And we um, very effectively divested that asset, opportunistically acquired four assets whilst um, gold copper projects were in the doldrums over the last uh, couple of years. So counter cyclically acquired those projects by leveraging that in-country expertise. So these projects were private opportunities, not being shopped around. So we think we were quite um, uh, opportunistic. And as I outlined in the opening remarks, we think we can advance these projects to the point where we have a reasonable chance of delineating a significant gold resource in a relatively modest um, period of time. So just a quick uh, snapshot of the project portfolio. So in a moment, Ian will provide a more detailed um, overview of these projects, particularly the first two projects, but just to provide a initial um, outline, our Las Brujas project is a significant land holding in a world-class Gold province. So I'll outline gold copper province. So I'll outline some remarks in the next few slides. But essentially, um, in recent months, we've encountered some relatively high grade mineralization, um, some large gold footprint. So we believe we're at the early stages of uh, several significant gold discoveries there. And certainly the region has the potential to host significant gold resources. For Greater Wakias project, a significant historical um, resource, several porphyry discoveries um, that were made 20 years ago. At the time, those porphyries were considered uh, to be low grade, sort of half a percent copper. But in today's world, that's obviously readily uh, mineable. And of course, half a million ounces, two grams uh, from surface is a very attractive um, resource and several pipeline projects, porphyritic copper, Sarah El Bronchi, and Sarah Dorado is the small mill we recently um, divested. So just to highlight the investment uh, proposition, we've uh, completed a major corporate transformation. So retired debt, divested a mill, acquired some cornerstone projects. We've outlined some near-term priorities. So. Um, these are the indicative technical studies in the center of the page. So Ian will provide a short overview, but we have a very methodical approach of advancing each of these projects and with a view of delineating significant resources. Importantly, there's potential catalysts. So we, we don't just have a low market capitalization, but we're not, but, uh, not being active. We're actually very active, have field programs uh, underway at the moment. And we're very much focused on that objective of large scale gold and copper. So we're not interested in delineating a couple of hundred thousand ounces. We understand the scale of projects we need to uh, delineate to attract the majors needs to be material, to be of interest. So we have some very high filters projects need to 
uh, jump through to in order to be evaluated within the portfolio. So this, this, this is a map we put together uh, middle of last year, just to highlight the significant um, corporate activity uh, project uh, farm outs in southern um, Peru. At the same time, interest was emerging in Ecuador on the back of Sol Gold's El Pala uh, discovery being um, appraised. And we felt that Northern Peru in many ways at that particular time was being neglected. So we uh, happened to have some relationships, uh, some operating experience. So we delineated some significant, uh, or sorry, uh, acquired some significant um, resources in that area. And more recently, we've seen significant um, uh, corporate activity in that part of the world. So we think we've secured an attractive uh, project portfolio counter cyclically. So why why Northern Peru? Um, obviously, this is a uh, this part of the world, sort of uh, the west coast of South America, hosts more than half the world's known copper resources. Large copper mines throughout Chile extend into uh, southern Peru and, of course, uh, up into Ecuador uh, more recently. So this is a significant, globally significant uh, uh, North Andean uh, mineral belt, mineral province, and in particular, the region we're most interested in where uh, our projects are located in this greater uh, Yanacocha complex. So the map on the right, where we've illustrated um, figure A and figure B, at the northern end, we have um, a Rio La Grana resource, eight, nine million ounces of gold, three billion tonnes of copper. And in the southeast, we have uh, southern copper, a billion tonne copper resource. And in the middle of that, we have 100 million ounces of gold resources being delineated over recent years. So by any measure, this is a world-class mineral province. And for us to have acquired an attractive portfolio really speaks to how opportunistic um, we've been able to be to acquire these projects. So this cross-section from A to B, we've provided in more detail on this slide, where we outline some of these operators. So on the left was that um, North uh, West project operated by Rio, and in the Southeast is the project operated by Southern Copper. So several world-class um, mines, several which are short um, running out of oxide ore. So uh, ready monetization options. And importantly, um, we acquired 1,900 hectares um, 18 months or so ago, but we've steadily grown that to eight and a half thousand hectares as we've uh, realized additional prospectivity. So now we're a major player in a globally significant uh, region and already encountering significant uh, exploration success. So not just um, high grade half ounce, uh, samples, but large areas of relatively low grade mineralization that are characteristic of large uh, fertile mineral systems. So very excited for a company of our size to have 100% of such a project. And I'll now hand over to Ian, who will be providing more details about our flagship um, projects. Thank you. Thanks, Barney. Uh Good day, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, looking forward to providing just a little more granularity on the project portfolio. I think Bahe has set the scene, and uh, certainly we'd like to begin, you know, with that Las Bruas focus. And I'll continue with the slide that uh, Bahe has brought us to uh, draw your attention just again to Yanacocha, Sara Corona. Tantopwate, which also is associated with the Antakori uh, Porphyry and Skarn play, uh, La, La Zanja, and again La Granca in uh, Rio Tinto's La Granca. <clears throat> the, uh, the district is characterized by um, the Calipai Formation, which is a uh, an Eocene active mineralizing period in the Eocene, but in particular, a the age of the Calipai uh, extends through uh, the Miocene. And uh, during the Miocene period, these fairly young mineralized systems in the 15 to 11 million year old range are very well preserved at Yanacocha. 
Cerro, Tanta Huate, and La Zanja. Um, we sit in that same promising geology, and uh, I'll just, I'll just, um, sorry, I was. Uh, so we're able to to see the host formation. The Calipi runs through here, and a series of younger volcanics associated with the mineralization encompass Serra Corona and Tantawate. And we have exactly that geology and similar structural um, uh, features that characterize uh, the deposits from Yanacocha through Cerro, uh visible and, and available in Las Brujas. And uh, we believe too that there is a major structural province underlying this uh, volcanic dominated uh, belt which uh, which shares its perim perimeter with uh, with Las Brujas. Most recently we've recognized some extensive tectonic breaches at Las Brujas and these uh, are in many respects similar to the tectonic uh, to the breccia and structurally hosted features that uh, that are, are uh, uh, well known at Yanacocha. Uh, there are small uh, caldera features uh, at La Zanja, a couple developed within the, the greater caldera complex uh, and, and that are associated with mineralization at the other occurrences. So uh, we're, we're very heartened by the, uh, by the discovery of some of these large structural breaches at Las Brujas. The Las Brujas project, uh, when we acquired it, uh, was uh, just under 2,000 hectares and comprised the area sort of outlined up here in purple. Uh, we uh, went through historical data, uh, Candente Resources had published in the past and included among their, their early data were gold uh, samples, positive gold samples down in this area to the south and we decided to extend our, our project to, uh, to include this area. Subsequently, we've extended out to the east uh, in part on the uh, addition of gold positive samples uh, taken by ourselves and in review of other historical data. Subsequent to that and most recently, we've acquired the area out here to the east uh, and this has been on the basis of uh, certain remote sensing studies that we've done and that identify strong potential for porphyry development east of the uh, epithermal target region we have, which is the gold region out in the west. So we feel we've composited a, a project that has the potential to host ore bodies that uh, and the classes that we have seen uh, for the occurrences from Yanacocha through Serra Corona and to La Zanca. So we think that the project portfolio that we've assembled uh, here at Las Brujas has the potential to host a very broad range of very compelling large copper and gold host systems. Um, We uh, re-entered the project on the ground uh, in the course of 2020. Uh, our plans for the year were able to proceed despite COVID, albeit at a, at a muted rate. And our initial uh, foray into the project uh, extended along a newly uh, developed and uh, reopened road on, on the project. So this gave us uh, early and quick access and we used that to do uh, some essential mapping and, uh, and a small sampling program in the early part of the year. Uh, so uh, the field crew back in February took a, a modest number of samples, 85 grabs, and, uh, and we were able to notice quite a bit of uh, varied alteration. We were able to see um, various clay types, so we got some argillic, which had been reported by Candente in parts of the project, uh, propolitic and, 
and areas of just general sort of philic alteration. So it was well mapped um, by our in-country team led by uh, Luke Pigeon. As a result of the historical work and the work that we did in early 2020, we were able to take the original Candente identified project areas. Uh, so in the north, Guacamayo, and their gold uh, positive region in the south. And because of the sampling that we did along the road, we were able to infill new gold positive results. Uh, these results were uh, arranged from sub a gram to 15 grams uh, at a point in uh, Grimaldi. So, uh, you know, we're able to identify additional uh, priority targets. Uh, we're able to see uh, that the geology is promising over a very extensive area, now extending in essence uh, uh, over five kilometers from north to south, plus a kilometer in width. And, uh, and we still have the potential uh, that exists down in the south, which we haven't to this point followed up. So now building a, a, a pretty comprehensive and large uh, gold, uh, high sulfidation gold project, uh, exploration project. We followed back up uh, each of the projects. Uh, so this, uh, we're splitting into the two northern prospects and showing the historical results by Candente, which ranged up to plus two grams gold, spread over uh, an area of plus two kilometers by two kilometers. Uh, our own work this year coming in and showing positive gold uh, over, again, a uh, multi-kilometer domain. Uh, in the southern prospects at Al Alambique, uh, we demonstrated again a fairly large gold system. And I'll zoom in on this area uh, in the slides to follow, but very compelling large areas of gold mineralization overlaying our, uh, our alteration mapping that was done uh, using remote sensing and the historical data that we captured the geologic and, and alteration data that was previously uh, made public by Candente. So it, it, there's beginning to emerge for us a very compelling, uh, large, uh, fairly complex series of alteration zones uh, that host gold and, uh, and seem to do so over a very extensive area. So for us, this is uh, very encouraging and, and has the, the look and feel of a, of a significant sized um, epithermal gold camp. So the work uh, that we've been doing at El Alambique, uh, we've identified a, an area that we now understand to have a slightly different trend to the one in the, in the slide here. Uh, a, a region that is uh, a structural uh, and major tectonic breccia that extends uh, through this zone and continues uh, some several hundred meters off to the off to the west northwest um, and is up to 100 to 150 meters wide and in the area where we have positive gold samples including a series of higher grade gold samples in this region here, which are not yet public, but we will hopefully make public very shortly. Uh, we have a very compelling uh, tectonic breccia, well altered, uh, developing on, on El Alambique. Uh, that feature is coincident with a local magnetic low uh, and will we we'll look and we've done some modest mapping to try and understand the extent of the tectonic breccia, which would be developed, uh, sorry, through this region here. So again, the context for what we're doing, it's a large, it's a large prospect um, uh, project with several significant gold prospects. And we believe that that, uh, it, that, that it really does um, set us up to develop a project that sits within the company of several other very significant 
different um, mineral systems that Bahai Baha described earlier. Zooming in on, on those, um, we've got the copper porphyry resources at Tantawatai and uh, Serra Corona, uh, significant deposits in themselves. The spectacular complex at Yanacocha with its plus 50 million ounces of gold uh, and essentially uh, we're neighbors to Lazanja, which is uh, a development that uh, continues directly to our uh, south-southwest. Uh, so a, a little bit about uh, the scale, the context for what we're doing. Again, uh, Lazanja, Tantahuatai, our uh, significant footprint occurrences and we're seeing at Las Brujas in our prospect inventory already pretty significant uh, footprints of uh, historical and reason and recently added gold results that suggest we have a very significant project with the right sort of scale of, uh, of footprint for mineralization that will allow us to continue with uh, surface work, sampling, and the expansion of these uh, known and newly discovered uh, mineralized occurrences. I think it's uh, significant to, to recognize that the area mines uh, all have compelling uh, high-level economics with cash costs uh, shown for Tantawate, for example, to be in the sort of $800, uh, $800 an ounce range. Uh, so our target looking for large, uh, low-grade, uh, high sulfidation and uh, epithermal gold deposits, I, I think is well demonstrated by the data that we have generated uh, to this point. Uh, just zooming in uh, again on Las Brujas to uh, focus on the targeting that the remote sensing gave us, uh, we were able to extend uh, knowledge of the gold mineralization in the north of the project uh, by tracking the, 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 uh, the alteration profiles that were generated by the, uh, the satellite work, we were able to uh, draw our attention into other areas of alteration. And we're also seeing compelling alteration uh, that caused us to extend the project to the east that is consistent with porphyry mineralization in the eastern area. So uh, we've used uh, low impact uh, exploration methods to contextualize the project. Uh, and we were able to keep the project moving uh, through COVID, uh, both on the ground, but also by using remote sensing technologies. Uh, we've now extended the, the project package. Uh, the red is, is the Fidelity Minerals package um, to infill between existing um, title. And we believe to now give ourselves a very, very significant exposure to a large um, altered and mineralized region that uh, we believe is compelling. And uh, this, this project is held here by a, uh, by a Candente subsidiary uh, and has uh, some records of past mineralization discovery. Uh, Las Wakias is uh, a project that uh, was the first uh, among the projects acquired. And I think Bahe did a good job of just contextualizing that at a high level. Uh, the project features an historical gold resource that was reported in the late 90s uh, with some higher grade gold uh, in, in a, uh, a composite vein system with up to 14 meters at plus eight grams gold. Um, we're in the process of consolidating ownership of the project, uh, which we acquired an original nine concessions. Uh, an interest of 44.5% over 3,600 hectares. Uh, we've subs subsequently staked around that core position for a further uh, 3,800 hectares net. Uh, some of the new concessions uh, overlap with historical concessions owing to a new matrix of staking uh, coordinates that uh, have been imposed in Peru. 
So uh, Las Wakias, in our view, provides us with a very strong foundation and an already existing, albeit historical, uh, resource base. Uh, so certainly, um, we, we recognize Las Wakias as, uh, as having strong potential, the existing uh, plus 400,000 ounces of gold uh, that were defined by Saliden. Uh, was really only over an area of the general vein and epithermal intrusive uh, situation at the Los Socavanes zone that uh, extended along about 500 meters. The zone uh, is both mapped uh, with a few drill holes and some ge and a geophysical expression that uh, shows that it's over two kilometers in length. Uh, so we believe there's substantial upside uh, at at uh, the Las Vegas project and the uh, Socavonas zone uh, for further gold. More recently, we uh, located historical geophysics, uh, magnetics, and IP data, which we uh, have recently had reprocessed so that we're beginning to, to get uh, a handle on the project uh, despite not being on the ground there uh, in the course of 2020. Uh, the reprocessing of the IP has shown excellent concordance with the known mapped historical geology and we've been able to overlay some of those historical drill holes uh, with the IP and demonstrate that there is some strong uh, correlation between IP into the epithermal zone, uh, but there is also uh, correlation with IP into positive uh, chargeability zones, which are associated with porphyry coppers uh, that, are adjacent, that are developed adjacent to the Socavones zone. So we believe uh, that that project has, sorry, has very high prospect uh, prospectivity on the porphyry targeting uh, with an existing historical resource that's available for extension uh, that targets gold, uh, gold with silver. The porphyritic copper project uh, is a prospect that has uh, two distinct zones of mineralization, historically characterized as the upper and the, and the lower, both of which have reasonably compelling copper numbers uh, available uh, with over half, an, uh, half a percent at the upper zone and about 1% plus at the lower zone. Uh, so this is historical work. We do need to get back in on the ground uh, in the near term to both understand the existing showings and to examine uh, to what degree these might be geologically connected or related porphyry events. The Cerro El Bronce project is 100% uh, owned by Fidelity and has uh, fairly high copper and gold numbers recognized in uh, epithermal vein, narrow vein systems on the project. Uh, this, this brings us to the Cerro Dorado project, which is uh, our mill mine complex project that Bahe uh, essentially described. We've, we're, we've sold the project. We're in the project, uh, process of receiving staged payments uh, for the project, which we own 100% uh, through the completion of the sale, uh, at which time it will be transferred. So we, we, we believe we've uh, set ourselves up through uh, a period of uh, somewhat more depressed activity to uh, hold four strong projects in world-class belts in northern Peru. Uh, we believe we've got four projects that all merit high priority uh, with particular uh, focus on Las Brujas and Greater Las Huaquias where Greater Las Huaquias offers us uh, a, a gold-silver system with an historical resource. So the, this project portfolio sits within a company that has strong insider ownership. Uh, we've 
significantly simplified the corporate structure over the last year. And uh, we believe that very rapidly we've put together a portfolio that offers substantial promise uh, for investors uh, in, in the near and medium term. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention to, to the presentation. Um, Bahe, I wonder if uh, you might just take a moment to, to close off. Yeah, thank, thanks for the going through those projects, Ian. Great summary. I think probably the uh, one closing remark I'd like to make is these projects have been acquired and are being evalu evaluated with a very clear objective in mind. They need to be of a scale to attract majors. So as a small, uh, relatively undercapitalized company, we're not interested in greenfield exploration. So this exploration is essentially a means to an end, to be able to answer questions that larger companies wish to have answered before they can earn into these projects. So we have a data room open on a number of projects and part of the engagement with Red Cloud Securities, their investment banking side is intended to assist us be able to attract strategic interest into from existing parties and new parties into these projects. So I think quite an exciting time for a micro cap company. So thank you to uh, Red Cloud Securities for the opportunity and thank you to everybody for dialing in, handing back over to Taylor. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ian and Bahe. Um, so we'll uh, turn now to the Q&A portion of the webinar. And uh, just a reminder to everyone on the line that you can type your question into the chat box uh, at any time in the webinar app. Um, so to start off, <clears throat> um, so first question, um, at Las Brujas, um, what would a potential um, you know, exploration timeline look like on this project going forward? I, I know the, the, the Yanacocha mine life, um, you know, it, it is extended to 2027 with their oxide um, and potentially there's more opportunity for sulfide, but what, um, uh, what would the timeline look like with regards to that to, to make sure that you can capitalize on uh, opportunities there? Not sure if you want to take that one, um, Ian, but um, perhaps I'll just provide a more general comment initially. Mm -hmm. um, just overnight, we had an update from the incoming mines minister in Peru. So obviously a very mining dominant uh, economy and looking at opportunities being sort of opening up in Ecuador, even Argentina picking up. So I think there's sort of competing uh, interest for these sorts of projects. So for us, I think the tide in Peru is well and truly uh going to turn in terms of uh, even more mining friendly jurisdiction in terms of las brujas um, in particular ian can outline the specific exploration trajectory but i guess at this stage the key is we've defined some key uh, prospects so to close in where the priority areas are we've completed some geophysics on a couple of these projects to make sure they meet our materiality threshold and under the way um, under the way we've structured these projects so they're held in subsidiaries we have small scale minor permits so under our existing permits we're actually entitled to conduct things such as trenching bulk sampling so we can actually do a fair bit of work fairly quickly and part of the way we've structured these projects and these exploration programs um, is probably under recognized by the market but that points to the in-country experience we have about how do you get these projects permitted? How do you evaluate them effectively? How do you move them forward where perhaps other uh, less uh, experienced operators may perhaps struggle? So that's a, a, a brief overview. Ian, did you want to uh, add more specifically what those programs, um, <clears throat> excuse me, may consist of? Sure. Um, Taylor, just to sort of pick up, you're right. The, the district sure is... You, I think that's Are you it. able to? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so Taylor, I mean, to just sort of finish your thought, yes, the, the region, the regional mines are maturing. Um, the, there's an established industry, you know, as we've pointed out in the district. And so the opportunities for new resources, uh, I think are, are very good. 
uh, that they will be gain attention for further development. In terms of our specifics, we're going to uh, take Las Brujas, we're going to uh, continue with what is being very effective for us, which is mapping, sampling, uh, on project magnetics, uh, and trying to recognize what the principal structural controls are to the uh, regional alteration that we've mapped remotely. Uh, and we're looking to accelerate that process uh, as, as uh, the COVID situation eases. So I, I've been exceptionally pleased with the progress of the on the ground teams in 2020, given the constraints. Uh, but we're looking to, you know, accelerate that all the while, uh, while pursuing a very sort of modest budgeted, very targeted and geologically driven program. Okay. Um, I, I guess with that uh, kind of leads into to one of the questions on the line uh, from Ken. He asks, um, what is your current cast position? Any financings planned? Um, I do know that you, as you mentioned, you are completing that sale of uh, Cerro Dorado. You'll be getting some payments in for that. Maybe you could just highlight the, the cash position. So in terms of, that's right, Taylor. So in the next uh, fortnight or so, we're anticipating a additional milestone payment from Cerro Dorado. And those um, warrants that we indicated earlier that are in the money at the moment, management expects to be exercising some of those warrants, which would put additional funds into the uh, company. Um, and after market today, we expect to be releasing the latest uh, financials and MDNA as well, which will provide some details and probably inappropriate to go into specific cash balance, but we don't have a significant cash holding, you know, as a micro cap company at mm -hmm. this stage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, perfect. Um, another question on the line. Um, it's a pretty general question. Maybe you could just, uh, it, it says, will you be following a prospect generator model? Maybe you could just, um, again, repeat your, your strategic model for the, for the listeners. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, there are some similarities with the prospect generator model, but in many ways, we don't intend to be focused on greenfield um, exploration. So in many ways, we think we can, and personally, I love the prospect generator model in terms of very little upfront capital, only uh, investing as much capital as is necessary to unlock value. So I think it offers great leverage on exploration success. So I, I love the model. I guess our twist on it is we're adopting what we're calling a project generator model. We think we can get that sort of upside by deploying a small amount of capital, being nimble, being agile, opportunistic, but without having to necessarily take greenfield exploration risks. So to give you an example, some of these projects when the majors or mid-tier miners were scouring, looking for big copper projects in the last 18 months, these projects weren't acquired. Why? Because they were held by private Peruvian interests. Anything that was in a public company got farmed out. So in some ways, we think there's ways we can leverage our in-country expertise and, and capabilities to get into attractive projects where we can generate uh, prospect generator type returns without necessarily being uh, completely at the um, uh, subject to expiration type um, risks essentially having said that when you acquire these projects las brujas is a great example we've acquired the project within 12 18 months a small land position grown it by four or five times in size with a you know hundred and fifty thousand dollar expiration program delineated an in inventory we're receiving unsolicited interest from major mining companies so that's the model we'd hope to apply at uh, porphyry copper as well and develop a pipeline of these projects, but we don't see ourselves as raising a million dollars to go advance Las Brujas to the next stage. We need to do more work, of course, but we're already seeing we're approaching a stage where there are better funded companies than ourselves that are, if not the natural owners, at least the natural funders of those uh, projects. The one difference, one uh, exception I'd make is Wakias, where very clearly the previous uh, operator delineated a inferred resource of up to 2 million, this is historical, of course, of up to 2 million ounces. So for us to be able to consolidate the ownership and move that project forward, plus two grams gold from surface, uh, gives us the visibility to conceivably become a developer um, of that resource. So that's something we're probably more focused on. So I hope that answers the, answers the uh, question. 
Very good. Um, kind of following up on that with uh, Las Aquilas, um, Paul um, on the line had a question. Uh, he says, with such an extensive Las Vaquillas land package, uh, relatively unexplored, how do you plan to upgrade or maximize this resource within three years? So I'm not sure if you want to add anything rather than me firing at all the questions, uh, Ian. I'm happy, I'm happy to, of course, but mm -hmm. I suspect uh, it might be worth you adding something in. Sure. Uh, so one of the things we've been able to demonstrate, Paul, is that um, the IP works that uh, that MAG is also uh, correlates well with the geology at Las Vaquillas. So we think that there's a fairly nimble manner in which we could use distributed 3D IP uh, extended magnetics and, and other surface-based techniques to broaden the, the uh, understanding and constraints of mineralization into the surrounding uh, areas that we've added and acquired at Las Vaquillas. We believe there's a structural extension to, to, the, re to the known Los Socavones and the, and the, two, um, and the two porphyry zones uh, developed there. Uh, so putting a buffer around that and just just better constraining the extents of mineralization using relatively light touch surface techniques uh, should help us, you know, fully contextualize the exploration potential at Las Vaquillas. Uh, so, you know, again, along the, the lines Bahe suggested, uh, not massive outlays. Uh, however, at Las Vaquillas, there is also the potential to do some resource uh, conversion along the Los Socavones zone. So that would be a, a bit of a novel um, change for us in terms of uh, putting together extended resource with drilling. Perfect. Um, another question, um, with the with the ongoing strong copper price performance, is there any plan to kind of uh, rotate your focus maybe and uh, look at those projects um, as well right now? So I know you've mentioned before you, you were focusing mainly on Las Brujas. Um, is there any urgency that's uh, coming or uh, <laughs> the price? Well, I, I think I think there's a there's a couple of um, so those porphyry zones that we haven't really touched on in the appendices. There's a couple of cross sections that I'd encourage um, the viewers to check out. So there's a couple of porphyries mineralized down to a couple of hundred meters. Um, half a percent, 0.123 grams gold. So they're by today's standards, I think very attractive uh, prospects and they have the tonnage in terms of the size that very much is of interest. So they're quite advanced. They've got a couple of drill holes in each. So they're known discovered porphyries. And I think they alone are sort of very much um, hidden within our portfolio. Separately in terms of Las Brujas, whilst we've spoken about the high sulfidation epithermal uh, potential, the porphyry potential, there's a lookalike prospect, so antiquary and that broader epithermal gold with an offset uh, deeper porphyry prospect to the east is very similar, analogous to what we believe we're seeing at Las Brujas. So with um, some subsequent geological evolution, we think there's um, a significant copper, so earlier stage, but significant copper potential at Las Brujas anyway. And what we're dying to do is follow up that porphyritic copper um, prospect as well, where we have known map discovered mineralization. And maybe just to provide a little bit of color about some of these projects, these prospects, these projects were, you have small artisanal mining. So there's no immediate villages within the area, but artisanal miners go, they discover some small higher grade gold showings. They pull out, a couple of tons of half ounce gold material from a narrow vein they put an added into the side of a mountain or, or, or something and then they uncover they discover some sulfides there's nothing they can do with those copper sulfides so they leave those as spoils at the you know the opening of the added for us to come along and identify having been in uh, in country for a long time look at these showings and put these together with a more uh, bird's eye view of how these may be related really gives us a sense of um, these are really, in our view, part of a much larger system. And we haven't gone into the details, but having uh, prospects of this grade, this mineralization three to four kilometers apart, lookalike targets within a hundred kilometer area that are, you know, plus 500 million ton resources. This is really sort of 
first, you know, first tier sort of prospectivity. So the sort of program we've executed at Las Brujas um, over the last six to 12 months, we'd love to be able to get out uh, early next year and perform exactly the same uh, at Porphyritic Copper. And even without performing any on the ground uh, work, we've received, you know, unsolicited interest in that project, but really we need to um, uh, delineate a bit more of a prospect inventory there before we sort of more seriously were in a position to engage someone. So right through from early stage exploration to early stage porphyry through to discovered porphyry uh, resources, uh, San Antonio and Cementerio, which are the prospects um, at the Wakias project. Perfect. Um maybe before uh, we wrap up maybe you could just outline what the the news flow is going to look like uh in the coming months for the for the company i hope you don't mind me in jumping in with a couple of go, um, go ahead I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll kick that one ahead. so is it, so so ian can perhaps describe the news flow on the active exploration program at las brujas that's a program he's coordinating um at the moment but from a corporate perspective we're uh engaged in a um ownership consolidation process uh, for the Wakias project. So we're a 44.5% shareholder of that core interest. And we believe that um, a consolidated ownership is the best way to move that project forward. So that's something we've been involved in nego negotiations with for some time. Um, separate to that, we think there's an opportunity to bring in partners on um, some of these projects. And I think for a company capped at $5 million, the sort of transactions that we anticipate are material for a company uh, of our size um, and beyond uh, the corporate uh, sort of activity the exploration activity so that geophysics we outlined today that's only just come through in the next in the last few weeks and ian's leading the reinterpretation of that so we think there's additional prospects targets that extend beyond the known uh, mineralization and similarly ian can outline um, las brujas and the and the uh, technical um, uh, developments we anticipate at, at some of the projects uh, in certainly so there, there will be uh, extended geochem geochemistry news uh, as, a, as a result of the sampling we have continued at las brujas uh, the crew remains on the ground uh, and will do through the middle of december so we're continuing to generate samples, mapping, structural uh, interpretation uh, around the El Alambique and, and north of that footprint uh, for release to the public uh, through the middle of December. Perfect. Uh, so with that, I think we'll uh, wrap it up. So I'd like to thank both Ian and Bahe from Fidelity Minerals for taking the time to host this webinar today with Red Cloud Securities. And thank you on to everyone on the line for tuning in with us. Uh, just a reminder that our next webinar will feature new Placer Dome Corp tomorrow at 2 p.m. So once again, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very Thanks, much, Taylor. Taylor. Thank you all for joining.